Hi everybody, my name is Anders Block. I'm Associate Professor in Sociology at the University of Copenhagen and I'm one of your co-teachers for this course on New Urban Life across the globe. And in the next 10 minutes, I want to give you the briefest possible introduction to one of the most important methodological traditions in urban studies, the tradition of urban ethnography. My focus here will be on core methodological issues. And then in the following segment, I will talk a bit more about practical aspects of urban ethnography and provide a few examples. And the idea, of course, is that together this will give you some context for your fieldwork, mini fieldwork, and set you up to experiment with some quick and dirty urban ethnography yourself. Now, in one sentence, urban ethnography may be, de be defined, as does this urban ethnography reader, as the first-hand study of city life by investigators who immerse themselves in the worlds of the people about whom they write. If we define it this way, Urban ethnography is simply ethnography in and of urban settings. The term ethnography, as you know, is used for a family of research approaches across a number of social science and humanities disciplines, not least anthropology, but also sociology, ethnology, human geography, and so on. And the core of these approaches is the practice of participant observation. Typically, the ethnographer will participate overtly, but sometimes covertly, in people's everyday lives for an extended period of time, watching what happens, listening to what is said, asking questions, and generally recording in her own field notes, photographs, but also via documents and other materials found in the field, any kind of data available to throw light on the issues and problems of interest to the research. Now, the deployment of ethnographic methods in urban settings has a long and venerable intellectual history. And this is one that is nicely captured by Peter Jackson in the article that we selected for your reading list. This intellectual history, as Jackson shows, is intimately tied to the so-called Chicago School of Urban Sociology from the 1920s to the 1940s. As such, the enduring interest of urban ethnographers owes much to the way in which the Chicago School paved the way for studying everyday life and tensions in specific urban communities, spatial patterns of settlement across class and ethnic lines, urban life at the margins, in the ghetto or in the streets, such as in Anderson's famous study of the hobo, or in William White's canonical street corner society focused on the social structure of Italian immigrant gangs in a large US city. And these themes really continue to inspire urban ethnographic work across the world, even as the methods and the way of reflecting upon them has changed quite dramatically in the meantime. Now, it may seem strange to be speaking about the Chicago School given that 80 years has passed. And indeed, as Jackson also points out, the school and its view of the city in terms of human ecological metaphors has come under strong attacks many times since, not least from neo-Marxists such as Manuel Castells and David Harvey in the 1960s and 1970s. However, as sociologist Andrew Abbott has recently pointed out, the Chicago School remains good to think with due to its important touchstone ideas. These are a focus on social process rather than on static structures, an insistence on the location of social relations in concrete space and time, not in some abstract theoretical sphere, and a methodological eclecticism driven more by insatiable curiosity than by scientific obsessions or obsessions with scientificity. And key to all of this was the school's deployment of urban ethnography, a method that allowed people like Robert Park, the mentor of the school, to capture through first-hand acquaintance the zest, the tingle, the excitement of urban reality, as Jackson says in reference to William James, the pragmatist philosopher and key inspiration for Park. Now, if nothing else, the Chicago School should be inspiring to you for the way much of its enduring work was produced by advanced graduate students who would spend a long time, typically years, in the field before having their dissertations published as monographs. The monographs of the school share a number of traits. As Jackson says, they are richly descriptive, capturing the sights and sounds of urban life in its various forms, and thus at best achieving a vivid evocation of a particular urban milieu. Moreover, the work is taxonomic rather than analytical. White, for instance, makes much of the difference between the corner boys and the college boys in the Italian immigrant community, mapping them out in ways like this. 
And finally, the work typically shared a certain ethos oriented at the policy setting of the time by showing how social and moral order prevails in what was otherwise often considered deviant communities. I will not go into any specific examples here because Jackson nicely lays out quite a few of these. Instead, I want to spend a bit of time commenting on some of the methodological issues that Jackson points to in the second half of this article. And as a precursor to this, note that Jackson himself writes from a particular position. As a human geographer in the early 1980s, he is a sympathetic, if somewhat distant, observer of a recent return to ethnography in urban studies. Following a period in which neo Marxist dominance had somewhat discredited the method. What Jackson says about ethnography, theory, wider context, structural forces, and challenges of generalization should thus be seen as set within wider changes in social theory in the 1980s, where the dominance of Marxism wanes and where a newfound interest in ethnography, urban and otherwise, sets in. What bears noting and what Jackson arguably underplays, however, is the way in which ethnographers, including urban ethnographers, have themselves been very concerned with these issues of how to bring in the wider context to their situated on the ground work. The Manchester School that Jackson briefly mentions developed the notion of extended case methods, exactly as a means of trying to address the usual criticism that ethnography cannot help us illuminate the structural roots of persistent inequalities and other aspects of how power and the political economy works, including in the city. Jackson himself gives some nice examples of how this can in fact be done. For instance, by thinking about the ethnographer's role as one of studying the instantiation of wider structures of ethnicity, class, gender, and so on, in particular social practices, or by studying the meanings that such identities tied to these structures carry in specific settings, or again by studying the conditions under which they become focal points for conflict and mobilization. Now to briefly bring Jackson up to date, we might say that the kind of tensions to which he points between ethnography as the situated study of urban life versus attention to broader economic and political forces continue to define methodological dis discussions on the premises and pitfalls of urban ethnography. In the early 2000s, Louis Vacan, a student and co-author with Pierre Bourdieu, the eminent French sociologist, published a scathing criticism of what he saw as the neo-romanticism of contemporary urban ethnographers. So whereas scholars in the 1930s up until the 1960s would generally celebrate urban deviance, Vakang argues that more recent work has shown an ideological inclination towards portraying the urban poor according to dominant middle-class values as basically embodying the Puritan spirit of hard work. To Vakang, this kind of moralism is to miss and leave outside of critique the political forces productive since the 1980s of intensified urban marginalization, what we usually sum up as neoliberalism. And as you would imagine, this kind of charge led to various countercharges, and one of them I will come back to in the next online segment. However, let me end here by saying that a somewhat similar debate nowadays takes place around a more recent discussion on so-called assemblage urbanism, manifestations of which you will be reading also for this course. And here, authors inspired by the likes of Gilles Deleuze and Bruno Latour articulate a program of urban studies which again makes a particular form of ethnography, this time more multi-sided and distributed, central to the study of how the urban is produced in specific settings. And again, critics from neo-Marxist political economy charge that such efforts misses the big picture, that is, the structural forces of economy and politics. This time around, however, the assemblers ethnographers have a different answer up their sleeves. Rather than respect this distinction between the urban ground and the structural forces, they suggest that the sites and settings of urban power, be they in planning, construction, design, administration, and so on, should themselves be studied by ethnographic means to situate their efforts and make them open to closer scrutiny. 
And I will pick up this theme again also in my second online unit where I focus on situational analysis. So stay tuned for that one. But now let's turn to some more practical examples of urban ethnography to get you started on your own work.